session on side channel attacks. My name is Ahmad Sadegi from Technical University Darmstadt. Um, this session will be amazing. So although it's after the lunch and I know that most of you are asking yourself, why am I here? I would like to sleep. Please listen to our uh, speakers. They will be very interesting topics uh, uh, during the session. The first uh, uh, talk will be given by Dimitri Ponomarov uh, about uh, side channels or cover channels through random number generators. He is a professor at Binghamton University. Um, and his student, Dimitri Evishikin, Evishikin he could not participate. Uh, Dimitri promised me that it is not a condition to be in his group if your first name is Dimitri. So please. <laughs> Good, after good afternoon. Uh, so yes, in fact, this is the only Dimitri in my uh, group in all the years that I <laughs> advise students. So uh, this talk is going to be about uh, a covered, uh, covered communication channels through random number generation a unit. Okay, in uh, particular, we showed it in Intel processors, but uh, other upcoming processors also have similar uh, hardware coming up, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Okay, so this was uh, the work done with my uh, student, uh, Dmitry Evtushkin. He uh, you know, wasn't able to, to come here. Uh, he's uh, the last year PhD student. He uh, will be on the academic job market this year. Uh, has pretty good record. So uh, I'm uh, doing the talk. All right, so what I'll uh, talk about, I'll give you the uh, introduction into uh, covered channels uh, in general and why uh, covered channels uh, are used. Okay, then we'll talk about uh, random number uh, generator unit on modern Intel processors, okay? We'll talk about the operation, look at the details, and we'll examine what creates uh, almost ideal opportunity for co covered channels in this environment, okay? Covered channels is not a new topic, and a lot of previous covered channels have been created, uh, but this one has some unique uh, and cool properties, okay? That's making it very practical. So we'll examine the cover channel, uh, I'll show you the example, we'll look at the uh, bit rates uh, and capacities of this, okay? And then we'll uh, show proof of concept implementation and finally talk about mitigation techniques. Mitigations are actually very simple, but somebody has to do them to close this. And then finally, I'll, I'll conclude my, uh, my talk. So uh, to give an introduction, let's uh, look at cover channel uh, communications in general and what they're used for. So uh, let's suppose we have processes, okay, executing the system, it can be apps, it can be regular processes. So normally uh, they uh, communicate uh, with each other using, uh, you know, different uh, mechanisms such as data share, such as, you know, shared memory, networking, file systems, uh, inter-process communication. So these are the normal ways in which processes uh, communicate, okay? But now let's suppose that, uh, Sharing is not desirable because, let's say, it violates security policies, some information flow control uh, schemes are implemented, uh, or applications performed to, uh, belong to different security domains, and so direct communications uh, is not available or is inhibited by the operating systems. So covered channels, in this case, allow you to perform this uh, communication without using this uh, means. It's kind of a secret communication or communication through unintended channels that two uh, processes, two applications can still uh, use to communicate. Okay, so let's look at the usage example of where this uh, type of communication can be actually useful, okay? So let's say we have a phone, okay? And there are two apps. One is a password manager that obviously has access to your secret information such as keys, okay? And let's suppose this password uh, manager has been compromised, okay? Now uh, there is a, you know, attacker, another part of the attacker on the other side, so the password manager app basically steals the password, communicates it to the attacker, sends it over the network, and your password are, passwords are gone. But now let's suppose that no network access is uh, available to this application, right? So operating system ensures that. So now, 
So would the passwords be secure in that case, even if the malicious app steals them, okay, reads them, but it can't send it outside? So right, you think it's all uh, good. So now, uh, let's suppose now we have another app here and call it the weather widget. Okay, let's say it's also uh, compromised. Okay, so then even if password manager can't have access to the network, uh, but there is a, you know, weather widget that has network access, obviously if your weather application works, it needs to connect to the network to check the recent uh, forecasts, okay? So let's suppose these two guys can communicate now using some data sharing mechanisms such as, a, you know, file access. Okay, so then this password manager uh, writes into a file, this one reads from the file, and then it successfully communicates these passwords out to the, to the network, and so the passwords are gone. Okay, now let's assume that there is no network access. Okay, and so no IPC, no network access, no uh, file system access, so applications are completely isolated or uh, some password data is tainted and so you track where this uh, data can be going out. So in that case, is that secure? Okay, so no, none of these legal ways of uh, transferring data, transferring passwords outside of the password manager are allowed. And that's where the covert channels come and allow you to still communicate this password, still communicate the secret information from one malicious process to another, okay? Without anybody knowing, without the operating system knowing, without user noticing, and so uh, that's where this uh, covered channels come. Now, it has been shown in the literature that shared resources, in particular shared processor resources, okay? Uh, such as caches, functional units, uh, and so on, can be used as uh, covered uh, communication medium, okay? Now, not only that, but other uh, OS resources such as file descriptors, uh, free space, uh, or network latencies, or, you know, thermal effects and different latencies can be used to uh, basically, uh, you know, enable the secret communication, you modulate the use of these resources in different ways, and you either tra transfer a logical one or logical zero, depending on the state of the resource. So, uh, that's how it in general works. Now, a lot of these channels shown in the previous works, they're complicated, right? So, for example, people have shown how to realize covered channels through last level cache. Now, in order to do that, you have to reconstruct the operation of the whole cache. You have to essentially uh, force the other, pro, uh, the uh, recipient of your data, right, to, to uh, ex experience cache misses. And to force the cache misses, you have to basically make sure that you populate the entire cache, which means that you have to reverse engineer the, the you know, cache indexing function, you have to deal with a lot of noise in the L3 cache, and so the whole channel becomes, uh, creation of the channel becomes uh, a heroic effort, right, that would result in a very low uh, bit rates, even if it's realizable. Okay, so what I'm going to show you now, I'm going to show you uh, a new cover channel through uh, Intel uh, random number generator unit, which would have none of these problems, which would essentially be almost an ideal environment for this secret communication. Okay, so before we delve into the details of the cover channel, let me show you uh, how this uh, random number generator unit works and what it does and what are the interfaces for accessing it. Okay, what are the instructions that I used? Uh, uh, so, so basically, uh, many applications need reliable and fast source of randomness, right? So, and this come in two flavors. Uh, so we sometimes need pseudorandom, pseudo, pseudo, pseudo random uh, numbers, for example, for Monte Carlo, Carlo simulations and things like that. And sometimes we need true random numbers. So, and those are typically used for like seeding software uh, pseudo random number generators. Right, so CPU manufacturer sensor that call, this call, and recent Intel processors, okay, support these instructions called RDRAND and RDSEED, which basically uh, use the, the hardware unit, hardware RNG unit in recent processors such as Skylake. Okay, AMD, the new Zen uh, architecture coming out, also according to the description, they also have this unit. It's not clear how it's gonna work and whether this same channel is gonna work uh, on AMD but uh, you know, it's coming. So on the chip, it's going to be located somewhere here. We, we, I mean, it's not really shown where exactly, but it's basically connected to the cores. You have you know, multiple CPU cores here, shared LLC, and somewhere on the chip on the interconnection network, 
uh, seeds that uh, random number generation unit. Uh, so, and let's examine how exactly that works, because this forms the key uh, for our creation of the cover channel. All right, so I, what I will explain in the next few slides are the principles of, of cover channel uh, creation here, and the rest is basically just mechanics and uh, capacity estimations and, and whatnot. Okay, so the way it works is that it, it takes the entropy from the source, source entropy, for example, some uh, entropy from the thermal uh, noise of the processor and so on, so creates this uh, random bits, right? So does health tests on them, okay? Uh, because, you know, some of these are not really random and it checks and uh, basically here creates the real uh, random uh, sequence, okay? And then there is a conditioner unit that essentially uh, makes a more compact string because this guy generates a lot of bits, I think 512 bits, this guy uh, basically shrinks it into 256-bit uh, chunks and then puts them into this conditioner buffer, okay? So that's actually how it works, right? So that, that gets put in the conditioner buffer, and then uh, in this conditioner buffer, we have basically four 64-bit numbers, which are true uh, random numbers er, er, derived from the entropy on the uh, chip. Uh, now, so we have two interfaces now to this uh, hardware, okay? So one is this, uh, so we have, we can have deterministic uh, random number generator, which would basically be used by this RGRand instruction. So in this case, this guy just gives a seed, a random seed, to the uh, deterministic RNG, and then this guy very quickly starts giving out pseudo-random number uh, numbers back to the CPU, right? So if a CPU cores, core wants uh, pseudo-random numbers, it will use this RGRand instruction and quickly get it from there. But another usage, and that's more uh, interesting for us, is this RDC instruction, okay, which directly gets the randomness from uh, this conditioner buffer, okay? So, uh, and that is used for, you know, basically uh, generating true random numbers. Okay, so let's examine now this uh, operation of this RDC instruction and, and see what, why it creates, uh, you know, potential uh, cover channel here. So let's say we have two cores, core zero and core one. This is our conditioner buffer. Uh, it has basically four 64-bit uh, entries here, okay? And this is coming from the conditioner, okay? So conditioner, uh, and now, so the, the other good thing here is that, you know, whenever the core uh, basically performs an access to this uh, data, right, there is a flag or, uh, you know, control flag that gets set. If it's one, then uh, the request was okay, so the rand random number was there and it gets returned. And if the random number wasn't there, random bits were, were absent because they weren't generated yet, uh, the signal of zero is returned back to the CPU and that's how this unit works. So uh, basically, uh, let's say conditioner unit uh, just fills it in with the four 64-bit chunks, okay? It takes time, but eventually it's done. And now core zero uh, performs a request, gets the first one, you know, CF is one, so that's a you know, legitimate request that got satisfied here goes to the next one, CF is one, next one again, CF is one. In the meantime, it takes a while for the conditioner to refill this, right? So that, that guy gets refilled, uh, regenerated, okay? Now that goes here, it gets a one, it goes here, that gets, gets a one, and then the next one is gonna be zero because this unit is empty now, conditioner is still working, or the, you know, the, the, generation of those bits from the entropy sources is still uh, ongoing and they haven't uh, finished yet, so it takes a while, okay? So basically the requests for this unit are happening faster than the unit is able to reproduce these bits, okay? And that's what we exploit here in creating the uh, covert communication. So basically eventually this, is, this guy is going to regenerate this. Now core one, and basically the requests here can go from different cores, right? You can have all four cores or whatever many cores you have issuing this request. And so core one goes, gets a success, and this guy goes, gets a success, and then the next one, core zero, core one is going to get a zero. So basically right now, core, core zero consumed the last available instance of this random bits, okay? And so core one got a zero. So now you see the, what's happening here, right? Core uh, activity of core zero impacts the signal that core one is gonna get. 
And that is the, basically the, the crux of the, of the thing here. So now let's uh, see how we can use these observations to create a covered channel through this unit. So uh, basically we have a Trojan and a spy, two processes that want to communicate. One sits on core zero, one sits on core one, and they're going to basically hit on this random number generation unit on this buffer and try to create contention or not. So uh, basically, uh, if the core zero wants to send a one, a spy, or a Trojan, uh, sorry, wants to send a one, what is it going to do? It's going to come and basically consume all these entries in this conditioner buffer. And then core one is going to perform access, it's going to fail, okay, because there is no, uh, no data in the conditioner buffer. And so core one, basically our spy, will figure out that the Trojan is trying to send a one because uh, the flag is zero, okay? And now if uh, uh, the, the, the Trojan is going to send a zero, what is it going to do? It's just basically going to wait, do nothing, okay? If it waits and does nothing, then a conditioner buffer is filled in the meantime, right? It takes a finite amount of time, but it, it's done after a while. And then, then the, uh, when the spy accesses that, it's going to, you know, the access is going to be successful, your random bits are going to return, and this flag is going to be one. And so this will recognize that it's a zero. Right? So if you want to send a zero, you do nothing. If you want to send a one, you just bombard this shared random number unit with a whole bunch of RDC requests. So basically, what we need to do to create this channel is that in general, right, activity of one process should affect activity of the other process, and that's what's happening here because this is a shared buffer, right? Uh, Trojan uh, keeps access in it, and uh, the spy uh, outcome gets impacted. Uh, programs have status to this uh, RDC instructions. That's uh, directly there. That conditional flag is set directly. So what this means is that you don't have to rely on any time and infrastructure. You don't have to measure timings, execute this RD, uh, you know, timestamp instructions. You know, that's difficult. Okay, and that creates noise, that creates delays, uh, limits the communication capacity that you can realize. Here, everything is given to you directly by the hardware. Okay, and finally, uh, process needs to be able to exhaust shared conditioner buffer and that we, we showed how it can be done just by executing a bunch of RDC instructions. Now, another thing is that there is almost no noise here because this unit is not used by uh, programs typically during their execution. So there is no contention other than these guys. So you can have this perfect playground to create a high capacity channel with relatively little effort, okay? So, and it, there, it's important to understand these covered channels. This is not the only covered channel out there, obviously, but if we understand them well, then, you know, the next effort is to close them, okay? So, let's uh, look at some capacity estimations here and what kind of uh, bit rate can we realize through this uh, communication. So, what we did, we basically just performed the experiment where we executed a sequence of RDC instructions, okay, and we tracked here of, you know, what is the failure probability? How likely it is that the uh, instruction is going to fail and by, oh, this sequence is going to fail. And by this, we mean at least one instruction in the sequence of five instructions fails, then the whole sequence fails, right? Fails mean that you can't get, uh, you know, a random seed. So if we execute five sequences, we never have a failure, okay? So basically, you execute four, you have four 64 bits, that's fine, but in, in the meantime, uh, you know, when you add to the fifth instruction, then one of these gets regenerated. And so the fifth instruction is usually okay. So typically, for three instructions you, you execute, one gets regenerated. That's, that's what's happening. If you do six or seven in a row, the probability is a little higher. Eight, it's almost 20%. If you execute nine in a row, you would fail with 100% probability. So if you put a block of nine RDC instructions, 100%, one of them will fail. Okay? So... Uh, we're going to be using that for capacity estimation, so these are kind of important numbers. So, um, uh, basically now, uh, what this shows is that requests to the RDC unit can be sent much faster than uh, the conditioner buffer can be refilled, okay? It, because if that wasn't the case, there would be no uh, opportunity for uh, this secret communication. So, in practical capacity, is actually five plus... Uh, you know, uh, seeds here, okay? So some results here. Now, so, so when we talk about capacities of uh, covered channels, 
we have to distinguish two things. First is what is the actual media capacity, the capacity of the unit itself, okay? That's one thing. And the other thing is what is the capacity of the practical channel where we take into account synchronization and all of this, uh, you know, uh, error correction and, and, and whatnot, okay? So that will be much lower. But for the unit itself, basically for the CPU clock at four gigahertz, our DC instruction takes about 0.1 microsecond on the average, okay? Success. Now, the other experiment that we did, we executed a whole bunch of RDC instructions and measured that's basically, you know, the ones that are successful and uh, we counted how many successful instructions we can execute, right? The ones that failed, we just discarded them. And turns out that a successful execution rate is about 0.32 microseconds on the average. So that's how fast this uh, conditioner buffer can be, uh, you know, refilled by these sources of entropy. So every 0.3 microseconds, the new 64-bit um, entry uh, goes there. And so then, what it means is that in principle, okay, the ideal uh, covered channel can have a capacity of almost three megabits per second, okay, in this case. If somehow all the, all the uh, you, know, uh, you know, problems are solved, this is what we can get just out of the unit itself. But of course, you know, this is just a, a you know, theoretical estimation. And so now let's look into some real uh, uh, capacities here, some bit rates that we can realize using this uh, communication. So now, you know, you could treat uh, this uh, channel in a fine-grained fashion, you know, you have four entries and just basically somehow manage it at an entry uh, level, okay? But it's too much uh, effort to complicate it, so we just basically treat the whole unit as a single unit. And if the request fails, you know, it fails, if not, it, it not. So we don't we don't like break uh, CB into multiple entries. So what what happens here is that uh, Trojan sends one by exhausting CB, right? By executing n prime. Let's call this an n prime. The number of RDC instructions, okay? And it sends zero by basically waiting for this time, the T refill cycles, and that's the time required for the conditioner unit to be refilled, okay? And then the spy is going to execute n probe some number of uh, probe RDC instructions to see if they failed or they didn't. Okay, so we have these three things. And so then bit rate of such a channel is going to be a one over max of this, because this is to send a zero, this is to send a one, or the other way around, one and zero. And then this is the uh, spice operation. So this is the Trojan part, this is the spice part. Okay. okay, so we also notice that on different cores, they have different uh, latencies, this uh, RDC instructions. So we take the latencies from the <coughs> closest core, Okay, so uh, basically what we end up, ended up using if we execute five instructions in the n prime, okay, then that takes two, 2,000 cycles because each instruction is 400 cycles. Five times 400 is 2,000 cycles. Uh, for the uh, refill time, we just did this, bunch of RDC, bunch of RDC instructions, wait it, and then see how many of these uh, failed, okay? And so what it shows is that uh, 7,800 cycles we need to b basically refill that completely. So now, and for the probing stage also, we need uh, 2,000 cycles. So then you go uh, plug these numbers in and you get four, uh, you know, 400 uh, kilobits per second. That's more like a practical capacity. Now we also studied the effect of GPU. You know, GPUs basically have some noise on the, on the interconnection network, so that delays things a little bit. But uh, the impact of this is not, not very significant. So we had formulas in the paper but it basically drops your capacity a little bit because GPU noise is periodical and it doesn't really change uh, much, okay? So now there are complex protocols that can be implemented, how to detect Trojan, how to detect SPI, how to know when to st start a transmission like pi pilot signal and stuff like that. These are all described in the paper. But for the simple proof of concept, we implemented this uh, idea of uh, simultaneous scheduling of SPI and, and, and Trojan, just to show what, whether it's possible. We just basically schedule them, uh, you know, uh, many times a second, thousand times a second, that, that worked. And so, uh, basically, we schedule them simultaneously using this uh, timer create uh, interface, okay? OS here guarantees very small deviations from the time, so they all schedule kind of together. And we prove that we can transmit uh, one bit per, se uh, per, per this scheduling and schedule them thousand times a second reliable with no, with no errors. We also try to transmit a byte in each of these, but there are some occasional errors that occur then. And so we need error correction codes. And if you use error correction codes to, to, to fix that, then you get about seven uh, kilobits a second uh, of uh, capacity. 
Okay, so, and this is again very dirty implementation just to show that it's uh, possible, okay? Uh, much, much higher throughput can be done. So now finally, how to mitigate this? One minute. Software mitigation, you know, you can basically trap in uh, the VMM here, okay, on each of these RDC instructions and then either delay the RDC instructions or disallow emul emulated in software. That's doable, that can be done, okay? Or you can equalize the RNG load. What you can do somehow is you, you can run, an, run another thread in the background on some core that would bombard this random number generator unit with RDC instructions that will distort all the timing readings that we uh, observed. Okay, but that may have a performance implication. This is more practical. Now, if, if hardware companies want to do that, if you are willing to change the way this random number unit works, you can either uh, basically, uh, uh, basically make a CB refill rate somehow faster Okay, accelerate that, or slow down the RDC instructions so that you don't give that random seed until it has been regenerated. You wait until it's regenerated, and then you give it out. So this will delay RDC instructions a little bit, but you know, they're not often, uh, you know, used too often. Or you can support fairness in hardware. You can just partition this across different cores and, and, and do it that way. Okay, so basically in conclusion, we showed this new medium for communication, for covered communication. Okay, using a random number generator, we estimated capacities, showed that it's actually quite high capacities can be achieved, and finally we discussed hardware and software mitigations. Basically, this is a real uh, practical channel that in future designs should be addressed. Thank you very much. Any questions? Uh, Please uh, introduce yourself. I'm Dr. Kravi from MIT Lincoln Lab. So I, uh, I know you mentioned that it's in the paper, but could you briefly explain how you, how the two processes know when to start? Or when to start? So there are two ways. So what we did here in this experiment here, we basically scheduled them simultaneously, right? Using, uh, you know, I showed you that uh, that POSIX create a ti timer. Okay, we basically do it thousand times a second. Okay. And, and that works. Now, in the paper, we discuss more complicated mechanisms because the same information from that uh, carry flags, right, the same status information about RDC can be used to figure out if the Trojan or Spy are running, right? Because, you know, if I'm getting something different from my expect, that means that my uh, Trojan or my Spy is running because it's impacting the shared state of this resource. Right. So I can use the same flags to figure out the presence. It's ki kind of very cool because it makes it you know, so that, that, that same code can be used to detect the presence. And then you have to do some, uh, I mean, there are standard ways to do that, you know, pilot signals and things like that if you want to be really optimal of when to start the communication, okay? Mm -hmm. And then you detect the context switches and things like that by, by these mechanisms. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, you seem not to be convinced, but you can talk to him later. No. It was a joke, yeah. So. <laughs> uh, Nick Moltari, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. On your chart, you're showing two cores with the shared resource. Yes. Uh, as you get larger and larger number of cores, though, sharing that same resource, the chances of noise uh, becomes larger and larger. So how does that affect the, the bit rate uh, of the cover channel when I'm getting four cores, uh, eight cores, et cetera, sharing that uh, resource? Right. So it depends on the resource. It's a good question. So if you, for example, if you share last level cache, right, every program always uses L LLC cache, right? There's a lot of noise there. The more cores, the more noise. Here, random number generator unit is only used to generate these true random numbers. How often do you use that? I mean, it, it, it's hard to imagine scenarios where this resource will be in high demand in, in practical situations, right? It's probably going to be free. It serves the purpose, right? It provides capability, but it's not going to be used often. Compared to some other resources that people used for covered communication, as, as I said, compared to heroic efforts in those papers, this is, you know, simple. Inside secure. I just wanted to mention that if you uh, uh, make the uh, type, make the REC instruction wait until there is a byte, you risk introducing a timing side channel. You have to make it always constant time. Constant time, right, 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 right. Obviously, you have to fix it, right? That's a good question. So we can, you know, you can wait constant time, but which is larger than the time needed to regenerate that first, uh, you know, the single byte. Sure. But, but it's doable. You know, once you know the problem, I mean, how to address it, it's not very difficult, I think. In software and hardware, simple fix in that uh, VMM uh, trap, okay? And then you can just do whatever you want in, in software. But, but, you know, it needs to be done. Hi, I'm Daniele. I'm from SUTD. 
Going back to the, the other question, I was wondering about the stability. Excuse model. me, what is STUTD? A STUTD, it's Singapore University of Technology and Design. Perfect. perfect. Okay. <laughs> you cool. knew the abbreviation. Yeah, it's <laughs> faster. Okay. No, well, I'm wondering about the stability of your attack because uh, let's say that the resource is just used for, uh, for, the, for random number generator. Yes. It is used just for, for your, your, from your process, okay? Uh -huh. So you are generating a lot of noise. Uh -huh. And, and what are the, the, the relation with, with the operating system in, in this case? Because if I'm from a software uh, point of view, I will see a lot of system calls that generates the, the random numbers, right? Mm -hmm. So you can easily uh, see if, if you are using your, your cover channel in this case. Because if there's just one resource right. using all the time. So right, you right. It, it could be one of the defenses, you know, to detect. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, right. So just like any cover channel, any side channel, I mean, there a lot of uh, this... Uh, abnormal activity gets generated, right? So okay. sure, that can be a one way to, to detect that. That can be added to the defense. And second arsenal. question, you are assuming that the, the process that is uh, asking for random, number generate, uh, random numbers uh, is using the same processor? No, time or not. no, that it so can be a different course. No, any, any course. No, no. Trojan runs on one core, uh, Spy runs on another core. They're on the no, same processor, but, right? On the same no, chip. May, may I stop? On different cores. Can yes. you please, I'm sorry to stop you, okay. uh, can you please discuss it offline? Okay, sure, uh, absolutely. Because we're a bit tight. Sure. Sure. So.